I'd like to invite you to give ear to the reading of God's Word. We're in the book of James now and uh, reading in chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love Him. And remember, when you're being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and He never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These dark desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us His true word. And we, out of all creation, became His prized possession. And I love it if, uh, if you, you wouldn't mind if we could pray as we get into God's Word. So if you would, please pray with me. God, we, uh, we do give you thanks and we give you praise for your Word. Because we know that, God, your Word is inspired. That long ago you inspired James to record this book, this letter. Not just for the church in his day, for sure, that. But also, God, for the church in our day and throughout the ages. And God, we want to thank you that your word is alive and active, that, that God, your word speaks to us today in our situations that you know by your spirit just how to speak into our lives. So that's what we're asking, God, that you would speak to each one of us. And as we hear from you, that you would give us the faith to respond. And we'll thank you for all of that as we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're starting uh, this new series. We started it last week. Uh, it, Wisdom, it's wisdom for holy living, not holier than thou, but that is set apart living, set apart for God. Wisdom for holy living in an angry culture. And what we said was that when you kind of boil it all down, uh, the book of James is about living out our faith in the world. And so that's really where this sermon series is focused, is living out our faith in Jesus Christ so that our very lives are a witness and a testimony to Jesus, to his goodness, to the goodness of life uh, in him. And I thought uh, it, it'd be fun and hopefully encouraging to start with a little story, um, true story that's in the news coming out of, uh, of Australia. Um, and I hope this is an encouragement to you. It certainly was to me. Um, there's a, a fellow there in Australia, um, fairly famous guy actually, uh, n named Bill Hayden. Um, he's famous because he has been a politician for a long time, and he is also well known to be uh, an atheist, right? Um, and in fact, he received a big humanist award, and so he's pretty famous for being an atheist too. And at the age of 85, get this, right? At the age of 85, he came to saving faith in Jesus Christ, right? That, that's right. Hallelujah. And, and I want to share this with you. Um, and, and I hope it's an encouragement about your witness because here's what he said is that, that a big part of him coming to faith was his relationship, his friendship with a, a lady by the name of Sister Angela Mary, right? And, uh, and by the way, Sister Angela is 93 years old. And so in case you're wondering, um, is God done with me? Um, no, not, not if you're taking breath, right? I mean, God's not done with you. Um, this is what he, he says. He says, I have always felt embraced and loved by her Christian example. He, uh, he had this opportunity where he and his family went to visit her when she was in the hospital. And uh, he says the next day, this is what he says, the next morning, I woke with the strong sense that I had been in the presence of a holy woman. Not holier than thou, not pretentious, not self-righteous, but holy as in I... I was in the presence of someone who is set apart, who's devoted their life to God. So after dwelling on these things, he says, I found my way back to the core of those beliefs, the church. But he says it wasn't just her. He says, witnessing so many selfless acts of compassion by Christians over his lifetime and deep contemplation while recovering from a stroke that prompted his decision. So we know that uh, we don't have to be a famous evangelist, 
that we don't even have to be a 93-year-old sister of mercy to help bring somebody to faith in Jesus Christ. We really only need one thing, and that is a willingness and a devotion to live for Jesus each and every day of our lives. That's really, that's really all it takes, that we would choose to live for Jesus every day. Every morning we get up, we commit ourselves to living for Jesus. And what James says is the key to that, and this is what we talked about last week, key to that, to living for Jesus as a witness to him each and every day is endurance. That as we go through the trials and, and the troubles of this life, that we keep holding on to the hand of Jesus. That we don't let go because we hit a time of trouble. We cling tighter to his hand as we walk through those times of trouble and testing with him. And this week, we're, we're kind of sliding forward just a bit. Um, same kind of story, same kind of idea. But really, what he's, um, what, what he's telling us today is, I think that it is key, if we're going to live for Jesus, we're going to be a witness for him, that we will have to endure temptation, temptation to sin. Because the thing is, that temptation, uh, that sin rather, that sin is opposed to God. It's opposed to the things of God, and it puts distance between us and God. And, and just to be honest about it, as we're thinking about our witness, it actually, it actually damages our witness to the goodness of God. Our scripture says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. And as we look at the scriptures, it's real interesting how uh, in our journey through the Bible, this has really been coming clear. Um, we, we've got these different images for this battle that we have against sin, against temptation. And so you can kind of pick whichever one works for you. When we were in Ephesians, we were in Ephesians, we see that there is this battle being waged, right? And we have to put on the full armor of God and go to war against sin, right? So maybe that image works for you. We get into Philippians and we're seeing a little different image. We're seeing that our life of faith in Christ is like a race that we're running. We have this course set before us and we are running this race against sin, right? So you could pick either one of those images, but what both of those communicate to us is that we are not going to be able to do this on our own. Our own self-control is not enough to defeat sin in our lives. It's just not. And so that's why this image that we have to put on the armor of God, we need the power of God. We are not strong enough to run this race that God has put before us. We have to keep our eyes on him. We have to keep seeking him, this generous God, knowing that the scriptures are true. Where God says, if you're tempted, you got to know that God's always, always, always going to give you a way out. He's always going to be there to help you, to give you strength through the temptation. And I think that this is really what James is instructing us about. It's like, how do I do that? How do I walk through this life keeping my eyes on Jesus so that I can do battle against sin and win, right? And so what he's going to instruct us to do is to keep our eyes on the Lord. He says, first of all, I, I see here, um, listen, James saying, you need to keep your eyes, we need to keep our eyes on the character of God on the character of God. First of all, to see what God is not like, right? That's, that's pretty important. See that God is not like this. He says, and remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong. He never tempts anyone. You see, God is not into entrapment. I think that's important to know. God is not trying to find some way to trick us so that he can, uh, like, have an accusation against us. That is not God's heart for us. Instead, James wants us to see what the character of God actually is. He says, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God, our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. The truth is that God is for us, and he fights for us. He's not even just on the side of the battle line. He's not just in the crowd cheering us on. He is actually there fighting with us. He is running this race with us. He is for us. You know, if you could just let me kind of geek out on some Bible stuff for a second here. Um, the, there are actually, in this passage, um, there are these two Greek words for giving, and it actually makes it kind of hard to translate in a clean way into English because we kind of, well, we just like have the one. And so it sounds a little bit weird, but if we were going to be really literal about it, it would sound something like this. Um, <laughs> whatever good giving, right, 
whatever good giving and whatever perfect gift. And I bring this up because what I believe James, under the inspiration of the Spirit, is trying to communicate to us is that God not only gives good gifts, but He is good in the giving. You know, sometimes we can give good gifts to people, but we have mixed motives, right? We have mixed motives when we're giving them, and a lot of times those motives have to do with, well, us. <laughs> But it is not like that with God. His giving is also for our good. When He gives, what He gives, His gifts are perfectly complete. It is all in His love. And here's the really good news about all of this. That the God who is for us never wavers. He never changes. He never casts a shifting shadow. Our God who is for us is always for us. And His promises are always true. It's not that God is capricious. God doesn't decide, you know what, I'm going to open the door sometimes and welcome people in, and sometimes I'm going to close it in their face. He, he is always, always for us. And ultimately, I think what James is trying to lead us to is to have a heart for worship, a heart to see how good God is, to look at Him and to experience His presence to know His goodness from His Word, to be in awe about how good He is, so that we see that He is always better than sin. See, this is a big problem when we're trying to overcome sin because we make this assumption that sin is good and that if we have to give it up, we're really going to be giving up the best thing. But here's what happens when we look intently upon the Lord and we see His goodness. We see that any time He calls us to give something up, it is always a giving up, a sacrificing of the lesser to get the greater. He is the greater. When we look intently on the goodness of God, it begins to grieve our hearts to even think about grieving the heart of our God. It grieves our hearts to think about putting something between us and Him and the beauty and the sweetness of His presence. It grieves our hearts. But on the other side, it delights our hearts. Get this, the more we see the goodness of God, it delights our hearts to think about. And this is biblical, that we can actually delight the heart of our God. Right? That We, we see God and He is so good. And it delights our hearts to bring delight to the heart of our God. And so first of all, James wants us to look at his character. This is how we keep our eyes on the Lord. We look at his character. We see that he is good. Secondly, James, he, he wants to teach us to keep our eyes, to look at, intently at the gifts of God. To look at God's gifts. And, and if we have any doubt about the first one, about God being good, we need only to look at his gifts. James is going to point us to the greatest gift the greatest gift that has ever been given, that is the gift of new life in Jesus. This new birth by the Spirit. He says, He chose to give birth to us by giving us His true word. That is the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you've noticed this. Maybe you have. Maybe you'd even be willing to admit it because uh, I'd like some like support <laughs> this morning, right? Maybe you've noticed that when it comes to facing temptation, that quite often we have this sense of deja vu, right? Like, oh, I've been here before, right? Can I get a witness? Okay, all right, Whew. It's like, ah, is this just me? No, okay. No. Yeah, that's right, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about, preacher. Um, but you know, each one of us has sin tendencies uh, in, in our lives. And my sin tendencies are not gonna be yours and yours aren't gonna be mine. We each have our kind of own sin tendencies, but the thing is, since we do have those tendencies, we, we tend to end up in the same place again. We tend to end up facing the same temptation again. And the truth is that there are times, and this is just true, there are times when we're going to lose battles. In this, in this war on sin, we are going to lose battles. And, and I hope, <laughs> hope that was not just me, right? It's really not. We all will. But here's the good news as we look at the gifts of Jesus Christ, as we look at His grace, the good news is that His grace, get this, His grace is greater than our failure. Isn't that good news? His grace is greater than our failure so that, so that when we do stumble in this race, 
by his grace, we can stand up again. And we can lace up our shoes again. And we can put on the armor. Whatever, you know, whatever image works for you. And we can start again. And we can start again. And we must also see this, this amazing power that belongs to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, so, sometimes I, I feel like we miss this. That when we trust in Jesus, the scriptures tell us that we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit, the power and presence of the God of the universe living in us. In fact, the scriptures tell us that it is the Spirit of the same God who raised Jesus from the dead who is living in us. So think about this now. Believers, Christians, brothers, sisters in Christ, think about this. There was a moment in your life when someone shared the gospel with you. They told you how radically God loves you and that he loves you so much that he sent his son for you. And Jesus, he and his great love for you went to the cross and he took all of your sin upon himself so that you could be reconciled to God and live with him now in abundance and eternally with him in the kingdom of heaven. And someone told you that and the Holy Spirit testified to the truth of the gospel in your heart. You could feel the love of God pressing in on you and you said yes. What did you say yes to? You opened the door of your heart so that the Lord would come and dwell in your heart by faith. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who reassures you that you belong to Him. Okay, somebody tell me what that is. Uh, who's it for? No, but who's it for? Not me. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, does it have a name on it? Anybody? Who is it? Tedrith? Tedrick Mazion? Okay, well, why don't we just, why don't we just pause for a moment and pray for Tedrick? Okay? If y'all would. Uh, God, uh, we don't know the situation. Um, we know that you do. And it uh, must be serious if it's setting off all sorts of alerts. So we pray for Tedrick. We, we pray, God, um, for a, a peaceful resolution of whatever the situation is. We pray your watch here and protection uh, over this child, Lord. We know that, that he's precious to you. So, God, keep him in your love and care and protection, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, so, so you said yes. What did you say yes to? To the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life, to fullness of life in Jesus. And, and if we ever begin to think, well, I don't know if I'll ever defeat this sin. I don't know if I'll ever have victory. I, I feel like I might just... <coughs> I might just give up. We must ask the Lord for help. The Spirit of the same God who raised Jesus from the dead, the Spirit of the death conquering God, lives in us. And so, as we're looking at the sin deal and we're fighting sin and we're fighting temptation to know these gifts, number one, this gift that that the Lord has forgiven our sins and he has won the war. We may lose a battle here and there, but we will not lose the war. It has already been won in Jesus. And then to know that we have his power to redeem our lives, to break the power of sin over our lives. Now, last thing, uh, the last thing is that James instructs us to, to see God's goal. What is it actually, what is it actually that God is trying to accomplish? It's real important. Like, what, what ultimately does God want? What does he want for my life? What does he want for the world? What we read is that we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. And, and if you're reading a different version, like an NIV, you may have a more literal translation. What the NLT is trying to do is help that make sense to people in sort of modern vernacular. But literally what it says is that we become a sort of first fruits. A sort of first fruits. And if you're into agriculture, right, a few people here are, right, then you know what first fruits are. That's like the first wave of the harvest. And, and that's what the Bible says we are. We're the first wave of the harvest. And that's why we're so special to God. Why? Because that first wave of the, of the harvest, that first fruit is the sign of what is to come. It's an indication of what's to come. 
So let's think about this now. Sin, when we let sin into this world, it caused this world to be broken. It is not what God intended it to be. So for instance, we see that rain, this really meant to bring life to the ground, life to the earth, that the earth is instead, um, that the rain rather, um, it, it, y'all still hanging with me? I know there's a lot of stuff going on, but... Um, <laughs> So that rain that's meant to bring life, actually it brings things like sometimes hurricanes and sometimes tornadoes. And those cells, right, those cells in our bodies that are meant for life sometimes turn into cancer. And that is not the way God made the world. And people who are meant to be a reflection of the goodness of God, who are meant to radiate, shine with the glory of God, instead get locked in selfishness and sin. It's not the way God made it to be. And so God's goal, His ultimate goal, is nothing short of the redemption of the whole of creation. God will remake the world as it is intended to be. And what the Scripture tells us is that God has chosen to start with us to start with the changing of our hearts and of our lives. You know, there are lots of people these days who do not want to need God. It's just true, and I don't say that as a judgment. It's it's actually a statement that makes me really sad. There are people who just don't want to have to need God, and so you will hear them say things like, you know what, I'm a good person, right? I'm sure you've heard this. I'm a good person, and in in some real ways, that's true, right? But here's, here's the bigger truth. That God didn't make you, God didn't make me to just be a good person. God made you to be like Him, right? God didn't make you to be a good person. He made you to be like Him, to be a reflection of the goodness of the God of the universe. And that's His goal with us. And James tells us this so that we will trust God. That we will trust what He is doing in our lives. That when He says, you know what, this doesn't belong in your life. This is harming your witness. This is, this is putting distance between us. This is robbing you of life that we'll say, you know what, God, I, I trust you. I trust you. And so as we're coming for communion this morning, that's what we're going to do next. What I, what I want to invite you to do, I think this is such a perfect time, is, is to do what the Scripture, to fulfill the Word this morning and see what God does. Because this is a perfect time to look at the character of God. This sacrament points us to a God who is love, right? And so it's a great time to look at the character of God. It's a great time to see the gifts of God. This is a representation of the grace of Jesus Christ poured out for us on the cross. It is. And this is a great time to think about God's goal. And it is nothing, nothing short than the redemption of the whole of creation beginning with us. And that's why he calls us his special possession. And may it be so, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. And if you would, please do pray with me. Oh Lord, we do give you thanks and praise because of your love for us. We give you thanks and praise because of the cross. And as we come to this, your table, Lord, we'd like to pray by the, the power of the Holy Spirit that, as your word says, we would discern the body of Christ, that we would meet with you, Lord Jesus, here at your table, that you would touch us with your presence, that you would help us to see your goodness, to see how good and to experience how good you are. And Lord, that you would remind us here at this table that your grace is bigger than our failure, that you would point us even in this very moment to what you want to do in our lives so that we would trust you in all things. In this and all things we pray, in Jesus' name, amen.